I'm Mark Fasco. Start out with a busy NBA scoreboard. The Wizards top the Jazz 114-111. Gilbert Arenas 51 points at the game-winning three at the buzzer. Knicks down the Kings 102-97. Bucks over the Bobcats 99-91. The Bulls have just defeated the Spurs 99-87. Kirk Heinrich 23 points, 10 boards, and 7 assists. Hawks over the Celtics 100-96. Chris Bosh with 27. Raptors beat the Sixers 104 to 86. Right now at the half, it's the Pistons leading the T Wolves 43 42. Last minute of the half, New Jersey on top of Indiana 60 to 42. Also now early on second quarter, Golden State 24, the Clippers 23. Chris Weber says he'll play for the Pistons. NHL, Tampa edges the Islanders 4-3. Bruins beat Buffalo 3-2 in a shootout. First period, Dallas won the Kings nothing. Also in the first, Coyotes 2, the Blues nothing. Carolina Panthers fire offensive coordinator Dan Henning today. The Packers promote Joe Philbin to offensive coordinator. The Giants will introduce Jerry Reese as their new GM tomorrow. Chargers running back LaDainian Tomlinson continued to criticize the Patriots today for their postgame celebration that he thinks did not set a good example. We're all competing. And what message do you want to send our, our kids? That the way you act after a win? You know, in my opinion, that's not the way you, you react. The Patriots felt disrespected coming into the game on their side. Oklahoma running back Adrian Peterson declares for the NFL draft. Ohio State's Teddy Ginn and Antonio Pittman both declare, so they'll leave school. Louisville quarterback Brian Bromno says he'll stay in school for his senior season. Hawaii quarterback Colt Brennan declares for the draft, but says he could change his mind and withdraw his name as soon as tomorrow. That's the latest Sporting News Flash. Coming up, more Tim Brando Show on Sporting News Radio. Nice night to say the least for your team. I mentioned about 10 more minutes in time of possession, 35 to 25. Must have been nice to be on the field all that time and move down the field like that. It was a very good uh, thing for us to be on the field like that, keep Denver's offense off the field, and uh, put our uh, electric offense on the field with uh, Larry Johnson, Trent Green, myself, Eddie Kennison. I mean, it's just a great thing. Got to be nice to uh, rely on Larry. Just give Larry the ball let him go, too. Yeah, I mean, we had two good backs. You know what I'm saying? Michael Bennett also came in and gave him a spark, uh, a couple big runs. And I'm really excited. You're going to have a kind of have like a little a slight two-headed monster. We got. Well, speaking of a two-headed monster, a couple of pretty good quarterbacks have played for you as well. Trent's back in the lineup, and uh, how's he done as far as you're concerned? How's he looking? I think Trent's looking pretty good. I mean, uh, so far so good. I mean, he's in. He's time he got two wins, and he's been throwing pretty well. Also. Well, no doubt about that. Any main difference that you see as far as the, the two guys? Do you have to do anything different uh, depending on who the quarterback is? Uh, no, I don't think I have to do anything different. I mean, because <clears throat> working, I've been working with both quarterbacks. I mean, ever since I've been in Kansas City. So, I mean, it's not that much of a difference for me to adjust. And, I mean, when Trenton just stepped back, step back in, I mean, he took over and, you know, he took over where he left off at. Yeah, any difference in the huddle at all? I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a small difference, I mean, but not really noticeable. But, I mean, everybody knows Trenton's back in the huddle. Well, no, there's no doubt about that. So, for this team, how big was this win as far as you're concerned? I mean, it was really big for us to get this win. I mean, it kind of it's like put us in the thick of things in the uh, AFC West. I mean, so we've got to you know, basically just win out and take care of business like we know we can. Well, and obviously for momentum, too, because let's face it, you're right there now. Yeah, we're right there, right in the thick of things. I mean, I think we're like, basically, we're, I think we're tied for the AFC West uh, title right now. So we're going to uh, try to uh, finish doing what we've been doing, just getting wins. So what's, uh, what's, what's this next week going to be like for you getting ready for the next contest? Uh, basically, we got to look at the film and you know, saying, see what we can do and uh, go out there and try to get a victory. You know, saying, we just basically got to keep, keep, the wheel, keep the wheels moving. Talking to Sammy Parker, wide receiver for the Kansas City Chiefs, here in the StepUp.com guest line here on Sporting News Radio after their 19-10 to win over the Denver Broncos. And uh, uh, the 31-yard catch, uh, tell us a little bit about that one today. Uh, it was just uh, basically a sideline throw. The, the corner came up real hard, and I, I kind of uh, brushed him off me, and I took it upfield and made a big and turned a little bit into something to uh, tell a little bit more. So when they when they call your number, uh, obviously three catches tonight, but you made the most of them. So when you go out to the field, when you go out to the line and you know you're, the ball's coming your way, is it kind of hard not to get a little excited? You're, they've called your number. I mean, it, I mean, it doesn't designate. You know, one what took one particular person getting the ball. I mean, it just depends on the coverage they're playing, and then that dictates where the ball goes. And I mean, so I think the coverage you know, what I'm saying, dictated it went my way a couple times today, and I took advantage of it. Cleveland's coming up next on the road. What do you think about the Browns? They're a pretty good team. I mean, we've got to go out there and, I mean, basically just get a win. I mean, we know they're struggling a little bit, but, I mean, they've been playing really, really tough games. And we've got to, I mean, try to get a victory with uh, 
especially when we when we can. I mean, we can't uh, let our guard down. Was it was it tough to have this short week getting ready for a Thursday game? Yeah, it was very it was a very short week. I mean, just getting the guys. A lot of guys are banged up a little bit from the week before, so we got to try to. You know, so we have to try to force guys a little faster than normal. You know, so we usually get two days off, but you know, this today we got. You know, saying we didn't really get a day off, so I mean, it was a quick turnaround. Yeah. So last thing for you, so a little bit longer week now to get ready for the next one. So probably good, good timing then for that. Yeah, I mean, we get we get a chance. You know, saying evaluate, look at the film, and try to uh, see what we can. We can we can get out of these guys coming up. So what was it like here on this final day with that lead? Obviously, you're pretty comfortable four and five shots all throughout the well, day. Well, you know, it was, but at the same time, uh, you know, I knew I had a lot of work ahead of me. But, uh, you know, to finish it off the way I did, to, you know, grow up in the state of Connecticut, uh, you know, a, a tournament where I used to come with my dad and my brother and, and watch all the pros as I was growing up and, uh, you know, to sit on that range or behind the ropes and ask for autographs and all those things. And, you know, to be back here and to, to win your first event is one thing, but to do it in front of all your kind of your home state fans uh, – you know, I wish everybody could experience it because it was pretty special walking up that 18th hole. Did that add any extra pressure? Like, oh, man, I can't blow this on my own Well, it was, I mean, I tell you, I, I didn't really kind of really start celebrating until I finally hit that second shot on the green on 18, knowing I could, you know, basically, I don't know, I figured I could I could get it in the hole from there. So, But there's no question. You know, I was pretty focused all day. Uh, for the most part, I felt pretty relaxed. I really did. Uh, I knew it was a... You know, I got off to a good start, which I think helped. I buried the third hole to kind of calm me down and, and relax me a little bit. And uh, from there, you know, it was a difficult day to play. The wind blew pretty good. Um, and uh, and I was able to really kind of hit some good shots and make some putts when I needed. And, uh, you know, again, it's uh, it's a neat feeling. There's no doubt I'm pretty excited the way I hung in there. And, uh, you know, this obviously opens up some new doors for me, and I'm excited what uh, what lies ahead. And the money doesn't hurt either. Absolutely. Absolutely. My wife will like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you started on Thursday, did you think, you know what, I got a chance to win this thing? Well, you know, I always said, again, uh, this is, I've played this event now. My first time was in 98 as an amateur. They gave me a spot. And, uh, you know, this is my sixth year on tour. I've had some chant close calls before. I feel like, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of gone through the growing pains and worked my way up the ladder, so to speak. And, and uh, you know, I knew my time was coming. Obviously, I'd, I never really thought, well, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love if I couldn't think of another place or a better place to win my first event, but right here in Hartford. But, uh, you know, it goes to show you if you just kind of keep keep plodding along and work hard and, uh, you know, good things will happen. And that's exactly what, what happened to me this week. So I would imagine you're hoping this is the springboard. Absolutely. Again, you know, uh, you know, this 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 gets me in the Open Championship, and uh, from what I understand, I think they were saying I'm now sixth in the uh, in the latest Ryder Cup uh, standing. So, uh, you know, it sets up for uh, for for uh, a lot to you know. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next couple months and and see if I can continue the good play. Anything in particular came together for you in your game? Well, I putted really well this week. Uh, that's kind of I've always hit the ball really well, but uh, I really hung in there and putted great was really the round that kind of put me in a spot to have a chance to win. And, you know, I, I shot 67, you know, a difficult day to play. And uh, it's just a neat, neat feeling. Welcome back to Sporting News Central. I'm Mark Vasco here on Sporting News Radio. Brian McRae joins us, former Major League Baseball player, currently with MLB.com. Brian, how's everything? Everything is going good here in Pittsburgh, enjoying all the festivities. I would imagine as a ball player, matter of fact, you not only a ball player, the son of a ball player with the, that kind of history, these are kind of things that you enjoy very much. Yeah, it's fun because you get to go to different cities and uh, and check out uh, different ballparks and, and be around guys at a different kind of atmosphere than during the regular season. And uh, I really enjoy PNC Park here in Pittsburgh, and I think they put on a good show so far here. And this city gets a bad rap. Well, and it's a great ballpark. I think there's a chance now for everybody to get to see this ballpark. Yeah, it, it's one of the best. I think uh, PNC ranks right up there with any ballpark that anybody can go to. Uh, sight lines are great. Uh, the view into downtown, the bridges coming over, where the, uh, the Roberto Clemente Bridge, where people uh, park downtown and walk across to get here, all the restaurants and bars in the area right there by the ballpark. It's a whole experience, even for people that aren't big baseball fans, you can be in the middle of something festive and fun. So where do you sit on where, should this game be an exhibition? Should it matter for the World Series? What do you think? I think it should be an exhibition. You know, the fans want to see the, some of the best players and the best players in the first half of the season go out there and, and have fun and compete. But I don't think one game in this format kind of format should be the determining factor of who gets home field advantage in the World Series. And, uh, you know, interleague play, is a lot more games played and 
the American League has shown that they're pretty dominant over the last few years in uh, All Star games, World Series. And, you know, the, the National League haven't won a World Series game in almost three years, or uh, they've been swept <laughs> the last two yeah. years. So, uh, I, I think that it should go to the, the league that wins the most games in interleague play. Well, you know, and I also think, too, if you're going to have it mean something, then you can't have the rule where every team has to have somebody represented. Either it means something or it doesn't. Exactly. you got to have the best players, and, you know, for lack of a better word, I guess some of the best players aren't here because there are teams that have to be represented, so you're bringing guys that have lesser numbers than the the guys that need to be here, so that makes it an exhibition. Well, and also, shouldn't maybe the guys like Griffey or whatever, you know, be there as well? Well, I really think that this is to reward guys. And there are a lot of first time. I think there's 23 or 22 first-time All-Stars. So I like the fact that you have a lot of new faces, some new blood, guys that are excited about being here. And that gives the fans extra people to root for and, and promote the game a little bit better. So I, I like the fact that it rewards guys for having a good first half and then some guys come on just their reputation and what they've done in the game. So I think it's a good mix there. You still have the stars and the names that people know, and then you have some of the stars and the names that people are going to know five, ten years from now. Talking to Brian McRae from MLB.com. Brian, a longtime Royal and played some with the Cubs and the Mets. Obviously, the, the Royals and the Cubs haven't exactly done too well this year, have they? No, and I work a little bit with the Royals, do pre- and post-game, and it hadn't been a whole lot of fun watching them play. The, the good thing, I guess, if you're a Royals fan, is Billy Butler won the MVP of the Futures game on Sunday here, uh, and Justin Huber won the uh, MVP of the Futures game last year in Detroit. So they have some good bats on the way, but uh, it, it may be uh, a few more years before both the Cubs and, and, and the Royals can get anything together. The Royals have to keep playing National League teams, I guess. No, they were, I think they were 10-8 and eight or so <laughs> against the National League. That's when they really got hot and started playing a little bit better, which everybody in the American League Central pretty much cleaned the clock of the National League teams, and uh, I didn't think there was that big of a difference between the two leagues, but right now the American League is head and shoulders uh, above the National League. Now, you were a player that used speed to your advantage quite a bit. Where, does, where did speed go in this game? Speed left when uh, the era of the home runs came in in the, in the mid-'90s, mid to late-'90s, and I think you, know, you watch ESPN, you watch the highlight shows, all you saw was guys going deep and hitting home runs, and that's what kids want to do. Uh, you, you don't see good base running as much as you did before. You don't see small ball hitting and run, uh, going from first to third, you know, all, all the things of that nature, or the stolen base. Uh, I think the stolen base was uh, something that pitchers and pitching coaches really focused on after that good run of guys in the 80s were stealing 100 bags or so. And they, uh, they, 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 they did a great job of holding that down as far as uh, slide steps, being quick to the plate, throwing over. You know, they, they really uh, put a stop to it. And if, if pitchers do a good job of holding runners on, which <clears throat> you see them doing a better job, <clears throat> excuse me, a better job today as you did back then, it's going to be tough. But, yeah, the speed aspect of the game is, is lacking, and uh, uh, that's something that never would go in a slump if you could run. Absolutely. You mentioned you know, some of the younger players in this All-Star game tonight. 23 first-time players, I believe it is. Obviously, it's great to see their excitement about it. They're thrilled to be there. Someone who obviously isn't there probably should be is, is Manny Ramirez. What do you think about Manny taking, uh, taking a pass? Well, Manny has some issues, I guess, with his knee that he felt it was better served for him not to come here. But uh, Jose Reyes is not going to play because of the stitches in his finger, and he's here. Uh, Glavin's not going to participate, but he's here also. You're the number one vote getter. I think you should at least make an appearance and let the fans see you. Well, and I just had a hard time with believing his knee is bad if he played all 19 innings of that ball game just before the All Star break. Yeah, that uh, that has people shaking their heads also, and uh, and a lot of guys say their focus is on the second half of the season for their prospective ball club, and if they are beat up a little bit, they, they want to take that time off, and uh, you know they get paid to play for their ball club, not to come here for the first, uh, you know, for. Uh, a couple days during the break. So I I can understand kind of both sides, but I'd least like to see him here, even if he's not going to participate because he was the number one vote getter. And just to, you know, tip a cap to the fans that voted you in and say thank you very much. Or even, you know, play one inning, take one at bat, and then go. Yeah, that that could could be also. (laughs) I don't think that's too tough on you either. No, but like I said, if he didn't want to play, at least come here. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and be, there are a lot of uh, activities that go on 
surrounding the game where his presence could be felt and, and needed uh, you know, to uh, just, just you know, this is a good chance for baseball with all the things that have gone bad and all the negative press they had to promote itself. And it kind of looks looks kind of weird for the number one uh, boat getter to be a no show. Absolutely. Hey, Brian, thanks for a couple minutes. I appreciate it. All right, I appreciate it. You uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, thanks again. Yep, have fun tonight. All right, thank you, Brian McRae, former major leaguer, of course, working for MLB. dot com here on Sporting News Radio. It's Todd Wright tonight on Sporting News Radio. Ho, ho, ho. And what can I bring you? Oh, a peace offering, is it? Very well. What say you trim those gin-soaked whiskers and bring me some plutonium? Well, can you be a good boy? Hmm, your inquiry intrigues me. Can any of us be a good boy? Are our primal urges innate or the result of the choices we make? Okay, wrap it up, kid. All right, Kringle. If the reward is plutonium, then your wager is accepted. I will be... Nice. And now, sitting in for Todd Wright, here's Mark Vasco. I'm a good boy, really. Welcome into Sporting News Radio. Three hours in the books, one more to go. And happy to be in for Todd tonight here on Sporting News Radio. 1-800-777-2907. The phone number to get in on the mostly football conversation here tonight. And why not? Two more games in the books tonight. Playoffs quickly approaching. One more week to figure out who's actually going to be in those playoffs. And there's so much parody slash mediocrity that it's hard to figure out who's going to go anywhere in these playoffs, for that matter. We've got a bunch of guys holding on, so let's get to the phones. Jim is in Baton Rouge, and now he's on Sporting News Radio. Hi, Jim. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Thanks for making it. What's up? I just wanted to... uh... Put a little plug in for uh, Drew Brees and Marcus Colson and Reggie Bush. I, I, I think that they are the deserved consideration for uh, MVP and Rookie of the Year. Um, and I just wanted to let the nation know that we appreciate all the thoughts from New Orleans, and we're just really on clouds uh, 9, 10, 11, and 12 right now. Well, I would imagine those guys are, uh, are helping your mood down there quite a bit. This has been a whale of a season already. Absolutely. And, and the thing I like about following my team is that all this other uh, – personality issue with with uh the, the wide receivers this year and 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 different positions last year we don't have that you know uh, if you look at the way they respond to a loss it's almost like a surprise well that was odd and you know <laughs> when's the last time the saints uh fans actually expected a team to win <laughs> <laughs> very much so well and then what about why well, reggie yesterday that was a good show absolutely you know they were saying that was his best game of the year i think it's hard to top a four touchdown performance against frisco but still you know, it was a. Uh, you know, they took away the passing game, weather conditions, and the defensive scheme. So they just, you know, they give it to Deuce and Reggie and let him run the ball. You know, Dallas had it all schemed out, so the fullback scores three touchdowns. I mean, how do you stop this team when they're on a roll? Well, I mean, the weapons on offense, like you say, between Breeze and Bush and McAllister and Colston, that's that's a lot to deal with. There's this, there's only so many guys you can cover. Yeah, and the defense were just kind of uh, waiting for that other shoe to fall. They're, they've been playing above themselves all year long. Although if they do it all year, is it above themselves, or are they really that good? And we just didn't know it. But they just don't have the they don't have the name talent, uh, except maybe from McKenzie over in the corner. But uh, you know, whatever wins. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time we've ever had a first round bye. Well, and you know, I mean, yesterday, do you realize? And I realize, you know, Eli has been struggling, but the Giants were zero for ten in third down conversions. That's pretty impressive against anybody. I don't care who it is. Uh, yeah, and that was coming off of a Washington game, which unfortunately I uh, attended, <laughs> where you're, you're thinking, you know, how, how are you going to, if you can't stop Liddell Betts, how are you going right. to stop Tiki Barber? Right, right, right. But obviously now 10-5 and five and the way they played yesterday, that's, that's pretty impressive stuff. Thanks for the call, Jim. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, happy holidays to everybody, by the way. Again, hope you had a great day. It was uh, and a great weekend for that matter. And, and a fun sports day today, as a matter of fact, with some interesting games. Just a couple on the schedule. I missed for some reason. I don't know why. The old blue gray game, you know, they used to have from <laughs> was it Montgomery, Alabama, every year? Was it Mobile? I think it was Montgomery. The, the old, that was like the only college game. It was so weird because it was that college all star game with 18 people in the stands all the time. So, I mean, that's why I'm sure that they canceled it because nobody ever went because it was Christmas 
But you know, it was like it was this game that's on national TV. There's 12 people there, but it was always just fun to sort of have that game on in the background. You'd look up and see, you know, some of these college guys you'd heard of, and you'd see. It's a shame that that game's not on anymore. Kevin's in Dallas now. He's on Sporting News Radio. Hi, Kevin. Hey, how's it going? Thanks Good. for having me on. Um, I just have to say, first of all, I can be honest with myself as far as my team goes. I'm a Cowboys fan. And when I look at it, uh, whether it's the game against the Saints or this game today against Philadelphia, don't get me wrong, both both of those teams are playing really well. But if I look at it man for man, I have to say that Dallas has more talent. And it's just unacceptable for us to lose the way we have in both of those games. Um, I think at some point you have to look at both whomever's calling the offensive plays. We run it four straight times and get nothing. Uh, no play action, and then you look at the defensive schemes in both of those games, and we were out coached both times. Um, I, I just want to know what you guys think about the coaching and where we go from here. Well, and I appreciate the call, Kevin. Here's I, I actually made this comment very early on in the program, and, and again, I know we, we picked up a whole bunch more affiliates once the football game was over. And, and I'll say it again, I have heard people talk about the incredible coaching job that Bill Parcells has done. And they all say the same things because he's dealt with T.O. and he made the quarterback change. Well, everybody would have had to deal with T.O. You know what I mean? And actually, some of the things he did concerning T.O. I didn't agree with. Yeah. And then the, everybody, at some point, any coach would have made that quarterback change. Of course. You have to, yeah. Yeah. So I don't see where all of a sudden that makes him coach of the year. I mean, this, like you said, this defense – They've got to get better. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And and I don't think they're utilizing T.O. properly. I think they need to drop him in the slot and get him with some quick hits as opposed to trying to uh, get him so far down the field every time. So, yes, they deserve credit for being a playoff team and for resurrecting a slow start. But let's face it, I think just about any coach would have done what he had done in those situations. So Agreed. All right. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate the call. Thank you. By the way, I just uh, saw this, and I want to make sure everybody knows, the Packers-Bears game has been moved to Sunday night. So they've decided that flex game is another Bears prime time, and it's Favre. It's the old, it could be Favre's last game. It's the Bears. They're always good ratings. So they've just made the announcement. So the Bears-Packers game, and for people listening, you know, in the Midwest uh, on the score, just so you know, your Bears are now a Sunday night game next week. And of course, I know for the score, it's 38 states in Canada, so everybody up in Wisconsin can't hear it as well. So Packers and Bears uh, are is now going to be the 8:15 Eastern time kickoff instead of the one o'clock Eastern time kickoff this Sunday night. So, and again, the Packers still have a chance to make the playoffs. By the way, which is another reason I'm sure that this is all part of this situation. So it's Favre, the fact that the Packers still have a chance to make the playoffs, the Bears are always a good draw, so that Bears game has now been moved to Sunday night. Uh, 1-800-777-2907 is the phone number. Tim is in Nebraska. Now he's on Sporting News Radio. Hi, Tim. Yes, sir. What's up, Tim? How you doing? Pretty good. How you doing? I'm doing very well. What's on your all mind? right, I got a couple of questions now. Um, why is Jeff Garcia so underrated for the Eagles? Well, I mean, I, I he got tagged with the journeyman tag, and once that happens, you're going to have to really be spectacular to shake it off. And obviously he's done a great job the last couple of weeks. Okay. Um, another question is, if the NFC and AFC, once they get into the Super Bowl, who's going to win, AFC team or NFC team? Well, I think that most people have talked about the AFC as being the stronger conference and how the NFC was pretty much the Bears and the Saints, and that's about it. Although, if you look at the last couple of weeks and what's going on in the AFC, <laughs> I don't know, all of a sudden you're thinking, well, boy, uh, Indianapolis isn't exactly a sure thing. You know, San Diego, obviously an outstanding team, but they just barely got a win here this weekend. Um, you know, Baltimore, yeah, that's awfully good. New England, I mean, but I still think it, it's whatever NFC team gets there is going to be the underdog. I mean, I just I can't imagine that that's going to be anything but that situation. Barry's in Chicago, and now Barry's on Sporting News Radio. Hi, Barry. 
Hey, how you doing, boo? Good, good, man. I just called up to defend my bears, you know. All right, go ahead. What what really got me what really got me to call you said that they're doing it with virtually no offense. Do you see that they're the second leading scoring team in the NFL? Well, they, but it's they that four hundred and twenty points, man. You yeah. know, only San Diego has scored more points than them. They and they, I call them a triple threat team, a team that can beat you with offense, defense, or special teams. And a, a lot of those points are from the defense and the special teams. No, is, no is, not is, most of them. Well, not no, them. no, but a lot of them are. I no, mean, no, like, Rest Gross. People act like Rest Gross has thrown nothing but interceptions and and uh, and, uh, and turnovers. He has 23 touchdowns. He lead, he he leads the league. I think he's tied with Mark Bolger with the most 100 uh, rating uh, games with seven. Right. You know he's not exactly uh, uh, just nothing. I, I, everybody was trying to build up Tony Romo and the Dallas Cowboys, but the last time I looked, the last couple of national league national televised games on TV at home, they've gotten their butts whooped. You know the Bears are the most consistent team in in the NFC because they're thirteen and two and they always they keep on winning despite their troubles and nobody never mentions that they're missing five key players off their defense three pro bowlers but everybody wonder why the defense has dropped off some I believe the Bears have learned from their experience from last year and I think they're going to be they're going to ambush whoever comes in the Soldier Field in January. All right, Barry, I appreciate it. Thanks for the call. I, uh, hey, sticking up for your team. Hey, everybody's got the right to do that, man. Absolutely right. And there's no question that they're winning despite injuries on the defense. And I actually, and people have given them grief about their win over Detroit. And, oh, it wasn't pretty enough. It wasn't dominant enough. You know what? It's hard to win in the National Football League. This team, this year has proven it. How many seven and eight teams are there? You know what I mean? So the fact that this team wins against anybody they get it done. That deserves credit. Absolutely. All I've said was that despite a 13-2 and record, this is not a dominant team, and this is not a team where you are completely confident that they're going to go all the way to the Super Bowl. You just can't be the way things have gone for them. Now, because, again, Rex has had some tremendous games. After the first month, for goodness sake, everybody had him in the Pro Bowl. But then he had a bad month, so you just, you just never know. It doesn't take away from the good games, however, that he's had. And obviously their special teams has been tremendous, defense has been tremendous, but they can be beaten. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Let's come back. A couple more segments to go. 1-800-777-2907. Mark Fasco in for Todd Wright tonight here on Sporting News Radio. Don't go anywhere. feel like a preserved moose on stage. Yeah, moose is fine. Welcome back to Sporting News Radio. Moose would be me, Mark Moose Vasco. Yes, that's what they've been known to call me. And for Todd Wright tonight, happy to be here again on this holiday. Thanks so much for being along for the ride. 1-800-777-2907 is the phone number. M Vasco, M V like in Victor, A S K O, M Vasco is the email. M Vasco at Sporting News Radio. If you want to get a hold of me that way, feel free to do that as well. In the meantime, talking a lot about, oh, well, who else? TOs in the news today. And of course, the, the doubleheader of football. And again, if you missed it, it just came out that the Bears Packers game is going to be the Sunday night game this coming weekend. So they've got that flex schedule. So they have now changed that game from 1 o'clock to a, an 8.15 Eastern time kickoff for the Bears-Packers this coming Sunday night. Let's go back to the phone lines. The guy's been hanging on for a little bit. It's Joe in Maine, and now he's on Sporting News Radio. Hi, Joe. Hello. What's up? Uh, well, I just want to talk to you about the Mark McGuire thing. Okay. All right. Uh, you were putting out some stats on him, and uh, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, those stats, uh, they're not Hall of Fame stats. Yeah, for people who who missed that earlier, I was just pointing out that, you know, for all this talk about Big Mac and if he should get in because of the steroids or whatever and we're not sure, I'm saying even regardless of steroids, 
the man had 1,626 hits. Well, right. the, I mean, 3,000, isn't that supposed to be the magic number? The man had half of that. Yeah, but he got the magic number when it comes to home runs. Yeah, 583 is awfully hard to argue with, there's no doubt. But I'm just sort of pointing it out. Let's, let's not just say the only thing to think about here is the steroid issue. I mean, the man had only 1,600 hits. He had multiple seasons of 13 doubles, 16 doubles, 14 doubles, which That's means it, you know, it's homers or nothing, in other words, because obviously he wasn't getting many singles. The guy had 1,600 hits. So we're going we're gonna to go along with, uh, from now on, uh, 500 home runs, not the magic number? Well, if that's all he's got, you know, and we're not sure how he got them, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, we're sure about how he got them. Well, <laughs> are we? <laughs> did he get them? Did he get him without? Did he get him without cheating? Is my question. Was cheating? I mean, as far as you know, he didn't do anything that was against the law. Well, again, that's uh, that's up for uh, negotiation. And my other thing is, you know, 155 strikeouts, 159 strikeouts, you know, 131 why, strikeouts. Why is there negotiation involved? So, to me... Uh, Major League Baseball hasn't proved that he did anything wrong. Nobody else has. But I'm just saying the writers are going to very possibly hold it against him anyway. I mean, there's a good chance he's not going to get in because they think he cheated. That might be enough for the voters to say... No, thank you. I mean, and and I'm also just pointing out, just also look deeper into the stats. If you if you're really not sure because of the steroids, you know, possibility. Well, I think there's other possibilities to also look at. The fact that 1626 hits, you're going to have to look awfully far down the list to find anybody else in the Hall of Fame with only 1600 hits. I mean, period. I mean, and I just said, you know what? If you're thinking about him for the Hall of Fame, then you got to start thinking about Dave Kingman for the Hall of Fame because Dave Kingman was just. <laughs> that thought, he won home run championships. I mean, he did. And that's all he did. He was not a defensive player. He didn't hit for a high average, but he hit home runs. So I, I'm just saying there's more than just the steroid issue. You have to look at the stats. I mean, hey, if the 583 is the magic number for you and that's all that matters, well, then fine. If you're a voter and that's enough for you, then vote him in. That's, but I'm just pointing out, don't, if people don't know the man only had 1,600 hits. That's not a lot of hits for the many the amount of years that he played. It's just not. Well, let's go back to the phones. Rob is in Calgary, and now he's on Sporting News Radio. Hi, Rob. Hey, Mark. How you doing, man? Good, good. Good. Hey, I, I want to shift gears back to uh, football. Can I do that? Absolutely, positively. I, I'm a passionate Bears fan. And, uh, you know, I think looking at the big picture of the Bears team, the things that, you know, call into question as to whether or not they're worthy of these 13 wins and the fact that they only have two losses and people say, well, you know what, they're going to be a one-and-done team in the playoffs again. I would say this, the things that made, made us question whether or not they were a good team, now that they've learned from mistakes, can't we say that those are the things that make them a scary team again? They've gotten through uh, a quarterback that, as far as I'm concerned, put up Pro Bowl numbers. He just didn't play well when the voting was there. Um, or, you know, when the voting was taking place, I think Grossman has been fantastic and, and more than what they expected him to be. Uh, I, I'm so glad they didn't go with Greasy because they're talking about an old guy that is not the future of this team. And as a Bears fan, I've seen Brett Favre in there for more than a decade, you know, and it's right. time for us to right. just have a quarterback that's there every game. But uh, coming back to it, I think the big picture of the Bears is that they've learned from their mistakes. Like the guy had uh, he called him before and he stated, uh, it's almost like we're going into – these playoffs as an underdog team, which is exactly where the Bears want to be. They're going to come up and they're going to punch guys in the mouth. And uh, you watch, I, you know, whether or not they're Super Bowl contenders, uh, obviously that remains to be seen. But are they the best in the NFC? Without a, without a doubt. I mean, we're talking about a team that lost to Miami. Well, Miami beat New England. You know, we're talking about a team that, that uh, has taken it to every single bad team and not, you know, the Saints haven't done that. They didn't beat Washington. Shouldn't they have cleaned Washington out? You know, so, yeah, I, I think that uh, the Bears are getting a little bit uh, uh, too much hate and not enough love as, as a team that have been super consistent in terms of winning games and using the full team dynamic to do that. Well, and as you say, that's probably a good thing for them then. No, I absolutely, well, I think so. You know, I, I mean, I hope so. I mean, they can almost go into it as an underdog mentality, even though they're 13-2. and two. Well, I, yeah, and I mean, I think the Bears organization always has a chip on their shoulder, but I think that it's the, 
that's what I'm trying to say is that the thing that has called into question whether or not they're a good team is the very thing that's going to make them a strong team. The fact that they did have their hiccups and now they're past it. We're looking at a quarterback that has thrown, what, five touchdowns in the last three games? No interceptions. Yep. None. He hasn't fumbled a snap. All he's done is played well, efficient, exactly what they wanted out of him. We're talking about a team that, you know, we're missing four or five Pro Bowl defensive guys. And, uh, and while, you know, we've allowed some points to be scored, um, what does the Bears' defense do? Go ahead, score on them. We're, we're going to get takeaways. We're going to take the ball away. We're going to put our offense in a position to score. So I think looking at that, you know, the Bears are getting better. They're getting better. Yeah, the Lions gave them a scare, but you're also talking about Kitna, who's put up amazing numbers despite <laughs> the fact that their yeah. team can't stop anybody. Yeah. You know, Detroit or, or what? Short of a defense could be a, probably a very, very good team. Well, I think yeah, and I'm looking I, at the Bears, and I'm thinking these guys are for real. And I, think, and I think the coaching staff has actually learned not to rest guys at the end of the regular season. I think they're going to play their regulars next week, too. <laughs> Which might okay, be a, and you know what? Couldn't ask for more. I think that that's the right thing to do. Yep. Don't sit them. Let yep. them play. Let Rex get the reps, you know, and, and keep these guys in there. And, and, you know, you're looking at a very scary team with uh, a little bit of rested injuries. So that's my two cents right. on them, Mark, hey, but I appreciate the call. All right, Rob, I appreciate you checking in. You and, bet. again, another guy stepping up for the Bears, and, and why not? I mean, obviously 13-2. and two, And, like I say, they say what you want about the Lions record. It's hard to win in the National Football League. It just is. I mean, like I said, all the seven and eight teams prove that, and yet they won again, and 13-2 and two is 13-2. and two. Terry's in Mesa, Arizona. Now, he's on Sporting News Radio. Hi, Terry. Good evening, sir. Hello, hello. A um, couple of issues with the Mark McGuire thing, okay? Yeah. As a historian, the reason I believe that the steroids should be a moot point, when you look at the history of baseball, the American League only came into existence because the National League owners were guilty of collusion and were keeping legitimate teams out of competing. So all records before 1900 have to be suspect because of that. All records between 1900 and 1920 have to be suspect because of the gambling. All records from 1920 to 1947 are not legitimate records because 300 of the best players of the world were not allowed to play. So how many home runs would Babe Ruth have hit if he'd been having to face um, Satchel Page and Bob Roberts and all those guys? Would Ty Cobb have been the stolen base leader if Cool Papa Bell would have been allowed to play? When you factor in that my grandfather played in the 30s and said they were eating amphetamines at that point, there is no such thing as a pristine record. So you have to just totally make the steroids a moot point. So when it comes to Mark McGuire's numbers, Gramity did not have a lot of hits, but look at his on-base percentage. Look at his total number of bases. Look at, I believe he's second only to Babe Ruth, ahead of Harmon Killebrew for most home runs per at times at bat. And his teams were fairly successful. Well, I can't argue with a single thing that you've said, Terry, and I appreciate the call. I, I was almost being more of a devil's advocate than anything else. And, and I still think that you, you have to look at the numbers. And obviously, you've just very eloquently talked about some of those numbers, and, and that's good. Uh, that's, that's the argument I wanted to have. I wanted to have more of a stats argument than a steroid argument because we don't know about the steroid argument, so... And like you say, there's a lot of other things going to have gone on in the history of baseball. And if, if you're going to keep bad guys out or cheaters out or whatever, there'd be nobody in there. So I wanted to have a, a stats argument. And I'm pointing out some of the stats that I don't like. You just pointed out some of the stats that are legitimate and that should be talked about. And that's, that's more of the argument I wanted for Mark McGuire. And I appreciate the call, Terry. Thanks for checking in. Uh, 1-800-777-2907 is the phone number. And again, I just, well, and I, and I talked about uh, Cal Ripken a while ago. The guy had nine seasons of, of less than a 265 batting average. You probably didn't even know that because nobody talks about it. And, and I'm not saying he's not a Hall of Famer, but I'm just saying there are things to be taken into consideration with different ball players. And for Mark McGuire, it isn't just whether or not he did steroids, as far as I'm concerned, that needs to be looked at. It's the lack of number of hits, it's the amount of strikeouts, it's the lack of doubles, I mean, you know, compared to home runs, it was homer or nothing a lot of times. 
Now, if the other stats that Terry talked about in your mind, plus the home runs outweigh that, then that's fine. But I'm just I'm trying to gear the argument to everything that he had, he had done in his career. It's not just he had a lot of home runs, did or did he not take steroids. There's more to the argument than just that as far as I'm concerned. 1-800-777-2907. See if you can squeeze Robert from Houston in before the break. Hi, Robert. You're on the air. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm um, listening to your show, listening to some opinions. There are some good opinions out there. I've got a couple of my own. I'm going to throw some things at you real quick. All righty. Number one, as far as coach of the year, I guess it's just another ho-hum year for the New England Patriots, but somebody's going to have to knock them out of the playoffs because they know how to win those big games. they got the blueprint for the Super Bowl. So I think that with the loss of Deion Branch, with the loss of Willie McGinnis in free agency, some of the injuries that New England's had to deal with, I think that Bill Belichick has done a remarkable job with a, with a very good football team and, and this and that, but nobody's given him any sort of mention. A lot of preseason people picked the Dolphins to walk with the AFC East, and here the New England Patriots are come playoff time, and they're looking like they're a pretty good football team right now. Yep, Robert, again, no question we're up against the break. Yeah, I mean, that entire Patriots team you take for granted. I mentioned earlier people take Tom Brady for granted because he just does it consistently and quietly every year. So does his coach. I mean, you know, Dylan, Falk, those guys, just consistent. They keep plugging away, and someone's going to have to beat them, no doubt about it. Much more coming up on Sporting News Radio. Stick around.